Hello and welcome to another video on the React Native intro, a course taught by Katie Kraman, uh, a software engineer where she holds a mathematical background and she previously worked at Formidable. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, a social first creative agency as director of engineering mobile uh, services and now she is currently working at expo one of the features we're going to see that in the react native eco ecosystem <clears throat> so the point of this today video oh my god is to make a quick recap of what i have learned so far and then jump to the uh, uh, list and navigation as a way to understand now how can we not only build React Native applications, recap part of the core concept, uh, what is the benefit of using React Native, uh, what is the narrative behind that, so we can, especially if we, hit, if we need to talk to someone that is on the field, hey, uh, be on the same page. And also as a way to improve my communication and skills, uh, which is something very, very important, especially if it's something that is in demand if you're going to provide solutions to your client. Okay, so uh, the idea here is also uh, look at this course from Frogman Master, so I won't able to show this uh, video because I received a red flag from there. They tell me, hey, you shouldn't record yourself while you're learning. So what I'm going to do is to, well, rec record my screen here, uh, taking notes out of that React uh, course. So uh, it was quite interesting to look at Katie Kramen, uh portfolio and uh, what she has done uh, here you can take a look at the Twitter uh, as well as their github and this course was published uh, four years ago yeah and so yeah the goal of this is to understand is how you can use react native uh, by understanding the core concept of building native applications using JavaScript, React Native. So this course is for everyone who, do, who wants to improve their ability to build these React Native applications uh, and are familiar with React, of course. So the knowledge from React is easily transferable to React Native, which is one of the things, and especially when you are moving to a particular framework tool is how much of this can I reuse that? So here a little bit of introduction about what you need to in order to develop this kind of applications and that is well or a window or a Mac or a Linux uh, in React Native particularly when you want to know what is this a little bit of history for context here uh, bear with me so because right now these computer devices the mobile devices has over 100,000 times more computational power and 1 million times more memory RAM than the leading computer or, or the guiding computer uh, that help people's land on the moon on the Apollo 11 so right now this is something pretty crazy what in the past 50 years we have accomplished and what we have now uh, aims toward that so because when you are um, navigating or using your web mobile uh, the web browsing navigation is suboptimal, unlike 
desktop or laptop experience. Even though we need to look at how is the mobile OS market share as a way to understand more about the market and when can we develop apps for the 99% of people out there. So it turns out that uh, GC, uh, uh, GS, GS Stat Account, or GS Stat Counter, which is a website that helps this small and medium business to make better informed decision. They say, uh, well, the global mobile OS market share at 2023 is, or 2024, uh, is 70.79% of Android users, 28.46% uh, of um, iOS, and the rest from other iOS. Uh, and then you have in Samsung, uh, you have also Windows. So the point here is to target the vast majority of uh, people using that the 90-90%. So for doing that, uh, Android and iOS, and because Android and iOS, they are platforms where you have to learn how to write applications in each one of them. In the case of Android, you have uh, Java or Kotlin, and in the case of iOS, you have Object-C and Swift. Uh, the point here is you have now a learning curve for each one of those languages, as well as their uh, features that they can use. So, because people in the industry have this part of challenge and problems, Facebook decide to have a go attitude to solving it. So that's what they say, hey, let's go to now have find a way to have one code base, one workflow, one language, using one dev team that can easily extend functionality out of that using JavaScript. And in this case is React. So this is where native comes to play. So nat React Native uh, targets, so the way how that works is by targeting its existing compilers, uh, for example, in the Android platform, and, they, and let they generate the artifact properly from those platforms. So the proper, <coughs> sorry, the proper library, ESUS, the proper artifact from those uh, platforms. In the case of Android, it generates is an APK, in the case of iOS, it generates some DMG or uh, another that I don't recall that, but it generates that particular artifact. The iOS, in the case of Windows, or in the uh, React VR. So the benefit of using this is that you have not only one single code base uh, that is indistinguished when you generate those applications from native app, uh, it is fully extensible because from one layer, or in this case, they might be using is the a bridge adapter, uh, where the bridge adapter say, hey, uh, if we're going to make use of different code bases, okay, but in this case, we're going to make use of different uh, platforms. So instead of having one gigant base class, we're going to split that that can allow us to make easy modifications and enhance those classes uh, from that. I know this is perhaps a little bit go beyond the scope because we're talking about the design pattern. But the idea here is to recognize which it is also a, a good a good thought exercise to recognize is like okay uh, how can we or what will be the pattern that the React Native is using behind the scenes okay um, so they might be using as a bridge 
uh, as a way to split uh, the functionality of a, instead of having a one gigant class, oh, instead of having one gigant class, uh, they split that into a hierarchy uh, which are much more easy to maintain and extend. And the other it can be is the adapter. So this is allowed to two different programs communicate each other. So again, um, for this is, might be a little bit as speculative, but the idea here is that if you can take a look at the Jazz and the React Native um, a design pattern, that would be something good. Uh, in fact, we can is getting into our Twitter, okay? Okay. Mm. Um. It is. It is safe to assume that React. Exactly, it's safe to assume that React Native is using um, Bridge and Adapt in Adapter Pair uh, System Design Pattern. Okay. So the bridge is the structural uh, design pattern, whereas adapter, exactly, where our adapter is also a, a, a structural pattern. Exactly, the adapter, the bridge, the composer, decorator, that kind of thing, packet and proxy. That is structure because they allow us to or help to organize is all of this uh, code classes uh, in a way that is much more easy to solve when you encounter a common problem. So you offer this common solution. Okay, that's that's good. But there you go. So, um, a point here, as we, as, as we move on, okay, is this, is that, hey, um, so this is the benefit that we talk about here, how does it work? Uh, so we can finally uh, answer a couple of questions, which is something very, very important, the, the facts here. These two questions was more like, what if, what have you, what is the categorizing experience when she have to solve or offering solutions to clients, uh, and then she sometimes decide to ditch the the React Native, or in other words, is that how what is the use case when you want is to um, what is the use case when React Native become cumbersome to work with? So, for example, if you want to uh, implement a, or if you want, or if you need, if you find yourself in the need to uh, yes, uh, if you find yourself in the need 
Okay. So if you find yourself in the need to integrate with some third third by third payment processors, that is, okay, uh, or to some specific email providers in Android, right? So anytime you we can broadly speaking, based on her experience, is that okay? So anytime you have to do some third party integrations. Uh, you might need to go to touch the code base, especially on Object C or Android. So, all right, and the other uh, is how performant or which models cause performance penalties. And that was a very interesting question. Uh, so far, or at least in 2020, uh, the way how people behind the scenes, for example, that use uh, the Hermes, which is the JavaScript engine, they say that there is no penalty in any model right now. And I think that's very, very, two very interesting questions. Uh, which use case you have the most problem to work with? Okay, so what is the pain point? Uh, on using, uh, yeah, what is the pain point on using is, uh, React Native, and the other is, um, yeah, what is the pain point of using React Native, and the other is there any performance uh, issues. Is there any model that we have to stay away from it? So then we look now at Expo. So Expo has been around for a while, for quite a while. Uh, Expo. Uh, I'm not sure when Expo was exploring React Native. I think this is something very interesting. Um, mm -mm -mm. Um, Wait a second, is that Expo React Native here? Ba, 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 ba. Expo is an open source platform. Yeah, but um, Foundation. Okay. Or oh, Birth. You know? So, oh, Birth. Uh, Okay, this is no, um, uh, Expo React Native, um, Birth, tell me, um, found it, found the date, um, okay might be okay crunch base exactly uh 11 to 50 people got <laughs> those it's, it's because of that it's like those company have now see they have become much more efficient and effective not only at a distance but with the technology that they have embraced that's quite interesting anyway <clears throat> Uh, and then you got this employee investors, think, uh, but it doesn't tell me when this was founded. Oh, okay, there you got it. Okay, 2013. When React Native, React Native, um, founded date 2013. As I already mentioned, React Native was first developed in 2013 as an internal Facebook project and then released to the public. Uh, really? Mm -hmm. Founders. Charlie, Ch Charlie Cheever and James Eady. Mm, Co-founder and CTO. And go founder. That's interesting. That's interesting. 
very, 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 very interesting. Mm -hmm. Log sec. Main protocol, interesting. Helm.ai. Come on, man. Studio socket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Okay, but Expo. Expo. Mm, interesting. Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> oh. Snap. <laughs> okay, but in 2013 this was founded. Okay, that, that's 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 interesting. 2013. Yep. Uh so Expo was founded at 2000 X. I put it here. Uh, 2013. Expo, Expo founded uh, in 2013. Okay, so that's great. Uh, and the whole idea of Expo versus React is there is no versus. It's actually it's a complement of the React. So. Because after all, React allows you to build this Android and, and iOS applications using JavaScript. And behind the scenes is there, uh, powered by the this JavaScript engine called Hermes, okay? which speed up is the uh, initial round or speed up the, the bootstrap of React applications. So the point of this is to look now at Expo, which is just a suite of tools that are built around and for React Native, and it is all about developer experience. So um, this Expo allegedly, I don't know if that's actually true right now, Expo uh, has a affiliations with React Native according to should you choose Expo for React Native overview of using Expo with existing React Native apps building apps a company actually using Expo for developing React um well um in any case uh according even to Gary Graman uh Expo and React Native doesn't have any affiliation back into in twenty twenty. I don't know if they if they have something about it. But in any case, they're separate companies. Um and there are also people that can become very uh, vicious and can take size here of where you want to, of, of why you will you have to go, which framework you, you should pick uh, instead of uh, the other, whether it's Expo or uh, React Native. Uh, the holy grail or the things that Expo allow is to <clears throat> be able to deploy your applications, be able to build, build, compile, deploy, and monitor your applications. So anytime you want to do any frequent updates, you can do through their Expo uh, pipeline. Uh, they also provide some service so they can capture is <clears throat> or they can convey is a lot of people uh, that they use in their service 
in exchange of convenience. <clears throat> but yeah, that, that's this core is all about. This core is about React Native plus Expo. So, so um, with Expo, you can quickly start to develop your applications, uh, which is something, yeah, totally, totally, totally. Um, there was no need to actually set up anything for that. Uh, in my particular case, uh, just a little minimal configurations on iOS and the other is on Android but yeah this small little configuration here um, So yeah, that's, that's, that's the summary of all of this, right? Is that uh, Expo allows you to start to run your application and, and this is great from uh, exploring the uh, applications or exploring is a workflow of React Native, okay? Because with React Native is you have to do that, uh, you have to do all of that a manual step especially when you want to set up your environment to run iOS as well as the Android for that. So that's, that's uh, part of the trade-off here. And the other is that Expo, because it comes with a lot of built-in models, anything that is outside of that, you have to do something called eject. Or in this particular case, you have to build a model for that. And that's where you have to go uh, on one of the pain points. Uh, but luckily for us, we have is now these iOS applications for that. So that's where you have to go die into the uh, native code. Java or Kotlin, Object-C or uh, Swift. All right. Okay. So with that huge introduction, all right about what is react native who is this uh, who is teaching this course gary Kramen, as well as a little bit of history for context something very very important because with that we can now understand where we are heading uh understand what is the benefit of using react native how react native works and how Expo uh, allows to work with uh, React, how Expo make our life easier for developing React native applications. And right now, here, uh, we'll take a look at how we can set up our Expo app. So based on their docs, you can take a look at that. Uh, here we can use um, uh, EAS, which is the Expo application service, as a way to streamline is the development process, build, compile, uh, deploy and monitor. Okay, it also uh, come with some uh, some of the native models that we can work with. For example, navigation, router navigation, uh, as well as models that we can use that are relevant to our iOS, uh, for example, like camera, uh, volume, GPS, uh, Bluetooth, and other features, right? Uh, and also, uh, we can integrate that with the cloud servers uh, as well. So, for the particular company that, I, that I'm working uh, they actually using is Expo and I can see the benefit of using that especially with React Native and Expo as a way to streamline that particular process uh, when they have to send updates over the air with low power device or in remote locations.
So without without cold coverage. Okay. So finally, getting started with uh, React Native. So uh, this is something actually quite interesting uh, because there's some consideration, as I mentioned before, if you want to develop application using Expo, you must be on the same network. This is when he send. This is when Expo bundles the JavaScript application and send that over the air, so you can actually see updates. Uh, uh, we also use uh, something called the linter, which is fairly common in vast majority of web development uh, as a way to help you to uh, fix common problems, ESLing in JavaScript. Uh, we also look at what are the features, or in this case, what are the plugins that we need to use as a way to help us with linting our React Native code, and that is React Native Community. Uh, and some uh, formatting here. So adding a linter and adding a code, code formatting. Then we have the debugging here. How can we make sh how can we familiarize ourselves with this debugging thing? Uh, what are the common shortcuts that we can use with? For example, reload an OpenGS debugger, uh, like so. According to Gary Kraman, this is what the vast majority of the time we are going through. Okay. Uh, they also use something called is Flipper, uh, but I think Flipper, I think Flipper, exactly, I think Flipper, mm -hmm, debugging React Native app with Flipper is deprecating in React Native 073. We will eventually remove out of the box support for GS debugging via Flipper. So uh, don't use Flipper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't use Flipper, and instead is just use is this right Hermes debug debugger expo, which is a way to say hey, uh, they're gonna use is the Google Crown, Google Chrome, uh, to inspect our code from that. This is something that is fairly common, especially on the mobile development, uh, using is in a an inspect tab whether it's for Chrome or for Firefox but from mostly from Chrome as a way to from Chrome using this inspect tab you can uh, link to that application so yeah that's pretty much how you can do this uh, and you can also take a look at the performance monitor as well so that was quite interesting. Um, and in fact, I can is um, npm React Dev Tools, uh, React Developer Tools here. Um, but this is more like exactly for React developers. As a way to install the uh, mobile and React Native here. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. As a way to look at errors and syntax error, lockbox, and performance. Okay. So after that, now after the setup here, uh, remember. So far, we have looked at uh, this course, the goal of this course, who, he, who made this course, Gary Kremen, and what is this course about, React Native, what is React Native, a little bit of history of React Native to understand how do we get here, very, very, very important. And then, uh, what React Native allows to do what is the benefits 
okay? Uh, how React Native work, what is the inner mechanism, what it's doing, and then we look at Expo as a way to enhance our developer experience using React Native apps. What are the common features that Expo allow, uh, allow us, the limitations, and then finally uh, set up a React Native app using Expo, which is using a linter and then uh, the most common topic that we have to get familiar with, which is the debugging. All right. So now, finally, we are uh, looking at these uh, basic components. So, okay. So, because after all, React Native used JavaScript uh, to access the platform API, and that concept is something important here. So the way how can we access to these components, okay, whether it's visual components or uh, behavioral components, okay, um, is through JavaScript. And React Native used JavaScript as a way to access to these features per platform. So the first thing is the UI tag, uh, how can we make use of the most common basic component of UI? So for example here, uh, when it comes to describing the appearance and behaviors, we use React as a way to now give you sense of what you're doing here. So when you want to describe the appearance and behaviors, we use React. JavaScript allows us behind using, so, or in React, React Native, allows to access the platform API through JavaScript, but React Native is all about is uh, controlling uh, or describing is the uh, appearance and behaviors. So, unlike React on the web, we can have access globally to HTML elements, but now here in React N Native, we have to import everything, which is, to me, quite frankly, I, I really like this approach. It is make much more descriptive, especially if you're using that with TypeScript, uh, when you say, hey, this thing decided to make a lot of sense. So you can now describe is the intent of the page. So that's great, because here with the UI React Native here, uh, First, in the basic component, we look at the JavaScript APIs, how React Native actually use JavaScript as a way to interact with the platform's API, platform API uh, such as camera, notifications, uh, keyboard, network uh, uh, requests, among other features. Uh, and also, in the case of React here, it allows to describe is the appearance and behaviors. And we need to import everything here, unlike in React Web. So, because of that, then we look at the view. The basic components here for describing is uh, appearance. So, view scroll and text stylings are just a couple basic components that we can use, okay? Uh, view uh, is pretty self descriptive. You can think of view as a diff. Scroll view, uh, where you can have this scrollable, right? As you can see, they have their particular uh, models that they expose, React Native. Uh, we also have is the text. Uh, in React Native, in React Native, uh, if you want to show uh, text, you must use this tag, okay? Unlike, for example, uh, on the web, when you can define text, whatever, in any, inside of any uh, tag, 
here is only in text all right uh, you you can recognize if you come from the web you start to see the the strict nature uh, the rigid nature of this uh, then we have is a styling and how would a styling is important to define is an object using uh, some of the uh, objects from the React Native as a way to say hey it's going to use these particular properties uh, and let React Native do the heavy lifting when it comes to identify when to render this and not, right? The performance optimizations on styling here. That's why we create this style sheet object. Uh, and, well, we talk about is what is the most common property where that we use on styles, whether it's position uh, and flexbox. If you're not familiar with flexbox, now it is time to get used to it. Uh, and yeah, you have position, uh, and all positioning is done through flexbox. At least in 2024, you can play uh, a little bit with this. Uh, some and a very good tip is flex one is indicating to give me the height of the padding element so with that you don't have to specify is the width of that of uh, your exact you don't have to specify is the height uh, of that as uh, unless you want to uh, in a word of side objects this is for uh, performance in catching reasons how you can define is multiple style per uh, components uh, as well as working with fonts okay and a very important thing here is that especially if you want to now share st uh, styles across several components there are several ways that you can do you can use the font as a global style pretty much like a web and from there you consume uh, per components or you can define is a component uh, that contains all of the proper style for that, and that will be that will be reusable across uh, components. So the subtle difference um, between these two approach is that in the component approach, you can is extend the functionality of that component making it much more simple to work, less code, less verbose, whereas in the global, uh, your file is gonna grow and grow and grow and grow, and the more people touch this code base, the more uh, conflict can happen. So the more, the more conflict can arise. So the idea here is that uh, abstract that logic or extract that mm, yeah abstract that sentence abstract that logic into their components that are relevant so if you need to touch that uh, you will only modify is this particular component this is also following is the uh, single response um, uh, single responsibility uh, in, in the yeah single responsibility and in other words make your code uh, do one thing and one thing well so following is the single responsibility uh, yeah following is the single responsibility Okay, um, so then we started to look at, do, we do an exercise here uh, as a way to say, hey, how can we now work with these basic components like view and scroll view? Uh, how can we also use uh, uh, things like text uh, as a way to get ourselves familiar with? Uh, I think that I delete that, let me get up here. Uh, 
Okay. And there you go. Exactly. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in fact, in fact, I'm going to run that locally. Yep. I'm going to run that locally. Mm -hmm. I'm going to run that locally. You say, hey, open your window. Okay. Right now, you're not able to see what I'm doing, but that's fine. Let me open here another Mac OS screen here. Da -da -da. And tells you, hey, uh, we work we don't capture and tells you is Firefox library Firefox list let's exercise mm. no, I'm looking for code exactly uh, Welcome. There you go. Okay. Uh, what? No. There you go. Okay. Uh, but I need you to fit this screen here. Okay. Much better. Yep. There you go. Okay. Cool, cool. So, uh, what I'm going to do here is to open. Wait, what the? Mm -hmm. Will you? Oh. <laughs> okay, how do I open here? Uh, oh, did it? Uh, mm-hmm mm -hmm. how do I open a yeah how do I open a task a an integrated terminal from keyword in Control back tick. Okay, control back tick. How about this? Is? Oh, there you go. <laughs> this is on Mac. Okay, control back tick. Okay, and here we are. That's right. Uh, good. So here we say, hey, um, right there. Front and master. Front and master. Here, this is we clone this. Say, hey, it is time to clone this. It will check my credentials that you got it. Uh, and you got is React Native here. We open up this. We can close. We can say, hey, um, close this window. All right. You say, hey, but I'm not able to see what I'm doing. No problem. Bear with me. Bear with me. Because here we are. There you go. Okay. Yes, I trust the author here. And yeah, pretty simple. Uh, to see is the basic of this structure. Uh, we got the packet JSON, packet log, Babel. Uh, this is the transpiler that allows you to use the latest JavaScript syntax 
uh, and make it work for any browser uh, or that works in any browser and the app.json which is the core of the expo application as you can see here we're having is this names log the version uh, this is pretty much to indicate what we're going to when we're going to locate is the resource and our main app which is this all right so if it wants to run this we can is do uh, is npn star in this case let's go for it npn we already have all the okay we need to install here we can do is a clean install as a way to let the npn take a look at the proper uh, libraries in the packet log JSON okay uh, and then say hey npm run star it will say hey and there's someone already using that port say or a one is running mobile in another window uh, use port 8082 instead you can say yes okay we're now going is as you can see here it, that that was quite fast by the way the following package should be updated for best compatibility with the install expo version expected version 15 okay we need to update that your project may not work correctly until you install the correct version of the package uh, but for our case, uh, since we're gonna do some basic stuff, I'm assuming that they should we, we shouldn't have any issue with this. Metro waiting here, okay, uh, and here we can now launch through the iOS um, because we already have our simulator working. okay right now uh, let me in fact share my entire screen so you can see what I'm doing mm -hmm. Like capture exactly so you can see what I'm doing here so as you can see here is this so now I'm using is expo let me in fact is minimize this so right now I'm using is expo here and it's telling me hey um this is how you can access to the developer tools dev tools like this okay uh, the most common feature according to uh, Gary Kraman is that reload and open GS debugger so for our case uh, we just get is this open up our app to start working on your app I don't think we have that oh that's right mm, interesting I thought we 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 update that anyway yeah I thought we update that mm. Mm, 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 mm. okay anyway so the another thing is that how you can now use or create components part of the concept from react native react uh, and how by working with react you can save a lot of line of codes uh, and again too much composition uh, can be it's not good uh, because now react have to re-render all of these components per se so the idea here is to find a balance the key here is balance 
So this is what I'm gonna do here. So um, instead, let me actually do this, which is this particular uh, command or line of code here for this in here. I'm gonna apply all of this. You're gonna complain because you say, hey, what is color box? As you can see here, you say, hey, unable to resolve color box. What the f are you meaning with that, bro? Or girl? Uh, none of this file exists. No worry. Stay with me. Because that's what we're gonna do on the other component. We didn't have that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... Okay, mm, I can create that, but I don't want to do that. In fact, I prefer to follow the exact. I prefer to follow the exercise here exactly, which is this um, part of the styling here. But I prefer to. This is some um, positioning. I prefer to jump this section and say okay this is the commit style exercise solutions so here we abstract is our component into a component per se now but this is looking at the component here uh, and is this color box color box uh, we can also receive some props um, pretty much like a normal react native application so the whole point of this is to copy uh, this as you can see is here all right so we what we did is just abstract this logic into their own components per se like this and then we export that normally and that's exactly what we're going to do here um take a look at the visual studio code uh i think we create okay a folder called components a folder called and i want to i want to show off bro i want to show off i want to show off a little bit and that is um where we are right now okay make I, let me actually zoom this so you can see what i'm doing no really okay much better so you can see what i'm doing here okay um hmm and then we say, hey, uh, shell here, npm run dev, but um, make their components, I think it's components exactly in plural. Uh, then you're going to create the components file color, call color box here as a GSX okay uh, yep that's a gsx they create that or, or they create that as gs okay uh, and i want to now navigate to that how so by going in by going to the palette here and then you say hey uh open up the color box here and then you do is this okay so far so good so here we're importing is react we are importing is the specific uh, basic ui components like view text and style and then we're going to create is our react component here we're receiving is props 
uh, and here we're defining is the color of this, all right? Uh, and then as a way to um, return or let React Native render this. So hey, you, I want you to render is the view and the text, and here uh, this is how you tell to using GSX uh, this JavaScript extend to render is whatever you are receiving from the props like color name and exco. Uh, you can make it much more intuitive, especially if you define it using TypeScript your code uh, if you, when you use TypeScript in your code base that's up to you that's also great uh, it comes also with some sort of challenge like the learning curve of knowing about TypeScript but in the long run it's going to help them uh, it's going to help you to learn about the intent of the code uh, so yeah when we save this uh, that's right and when we open up no way okay when we open up here is this okay um and here we say hey i want you to open now this this must be already done it tells hey um, check the render methods because they say hey um, this seems not to exist hey tell me this uh, components color okay error unable to find that the question is um, since I already defined this, if I go to the simulator, are you able to see that? That's right. Mm, okay. Uh, it's not good when it comes to. Yeah, it's not good when it comes to tell you which, uh, what happened. Okay. Here the the debugging here or the console error here is not quite good here. Uh, because it's not refreshing that but it doesn't matter we actually were able to render this list component so far so good okay uh, and then um, we look now and a very interesting topic which is uh, what the vast majority of time as react developers whether it's on the web or on the mobile uh, we're gonna do right is listing elements and pre-populate form or creating form forms and lists okay so uh, unlike the web this particular UI components have their subtle things to work with which means is that in list, um, you need to find a way to make your applications be scalable. In other words, is let these elements be uh, renderable, re renderable. Uh, as their applications grow and grow and grow and grow. So in React Native, you shouldn't use map do to performance okay that's the first subtle difference here between list uh, on react native and how you list or you can render list on the web so on the web you can use this map for that which is in fact is something that is encouraged to use that whereas now in here in the list uh, on React Native, you must is use is uh, a particular UI elements, which is list. Okay, React Native will attempt to render all single elements in the rate all at once, regardless of whatever they are visible on the scroll 
on the scroll on the screen or not that's one of the things um, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we shouldn't use a uh, map because unlike because here we're gonna render with a lot of these components whether is they are visible on the screen or not so because of that now we're gonna use this this specific list UI components uh, where you can have is flag list or section list uh, so flag list or like section list is it allows you to create some sections or some headers on their list uh, as well as each one of them provide you some uh, features here so for example in the case of sections list it gives an array of objects whereas flat list is used in a single array of string or numbers so remember that the idea here is that because now React Native is exposing a certain UI components or models as a way to interact with the existing uh, platforms API, they provide this uh, layer of abstractions, which is in the case of rendering elements like flat lists and section lists. So flat lists. Uh, is only okay flat list on uh, flat list on is only flat list only renders uh, single arrays whereas section list is for uh, rendering uh, is array of objects okay sections list allow you to add section headers and control how would look like. So this is the subtle difference between the flat list and section list, you know, as a way to get myself familiar with. Uh, and what are the most common props that we're gonna use with these two components? So item separator components, okay, list empty components useful when you want to pull data or, or for data fetching on loading scenarios uh, list footer component okay list header com list footer component pretty descriptive list header component as well extra data okay and performing interface for rendering section uh, wait what there is extra data here. A market property for telling the list to re-render since it is implements pure component. If any of your render items, header, footer, etc., functions depend on any outside of the data props. Stick it here and treat it immutable. So when certain elements depends on that. Okay. Well, they release the 70. God damn. Okay. When. Mm -hmm. So when certain elements depend on that, on anything outside of the data props, so with any dependencies or, or when you need to tell the list to re render, for example, you have uh, a list of items that needs to be updated. Frequently, uh, let's say you have several orders, okay, that you are tracking, and you want to know is the current state of each one of them, uh, or you want to know when a particularly, or you want to update individuals uh, orders, okay, that's when you can use extra data mm -hmm. for render. Exactly, a market property for telling the list to re-render. It can be useful to recap that, you know? That would be useful to recap about that. Uh, and that is, let me take a look at... So, go back to this. 
Okay, so go back to this. So you got it. No, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary Kraman, here we are. You might have already recognized are from the solarized color scheme, which is one of my favorites. And the color palette actually consists of 16 colors, not just four. And here's all of them. I would like uh, you to modify your code to use a flat list to display all these colors. Here's um, a screenshot of what I would expect you to look on. And for extra credit, you could also try figuring out how to display the text practice. Um, these colors you might have already recognized are from the uh, solarized color scheme, which is one of my favorites. And the color palettes actually consist color scheme, which is are from the Cook Solarized color scheme, which is one of my favorites. And the color palettes actually consist of 16 colors, not just four. And here's all of them. I would like uh, you to modify your code to use a flat list to display all these colors. Here's um, a screenshot of what I would expect you to look on. And for extra credit, You could also try figuring out how to display the text in dark for the lighter palette color. Mm -hmm. This implementation is pretty good for. So I'm going to add this back. Uh, list. Oh, the, um, she mentioned. She mentioned something here. Okay. She mentioned exactly. She mentioned is um, the common property that we are that that are shared across flat list and section list. So again, to recap. Section list and flat list, subtle different. Section list is uh, uh, works with array of objects. Flat list is with normal arrays. And uh, with section list, you can control how the headers will look like, headers or footers. Uh, and the common property they have is here. So they have is uh, sections and array of objects where you're gonna pass the data or the data here. All right. So the flat list has the data, and the section list have the sections. Uh, and here you have a key extractors. Okay, the same as flat list. So the key extractor is a function that must return a unique value uh, as a way to indicate, hey, how can you do that? How can you not? Let the uh, React Native, or in this case, the React, to handle is the uh, the list here. In other words, it's like, hey, let me now delegate this to you. All right. Um, so you can do performance optimizations around that. And then you got is the render item how this is a function to, to tell how this how uh, individual elements will look like we got this here on the render items as well as the render section is how each sections will look like so i think the the understanding is the anatomy of this components uh, is something interesting as well as their subtle difference and list props that uh, list prop must use by Caddy Kramen. Okay, by Caddy Caddy Kramen. So item separators components, list empty components, list footer components, uh, list header components. It's quite uh, 
cell descriptives, item separators, list components, list footer components, uh, list headers, extra data. When you want to tell to the list to re-render certain elements here, a market properly for telling the list to re-render if any of your render item, header, footer, etc. functions depend on anything outside of the data props. So this is great if you want to re-render components based on data. You can pretty much think of this as like user effect. Like user effect. Yep, like user effect. Um, extra data, num, uh, num columns, a very handy property. Only in flat list. And on enrich, uh, to pass a callback, for example, to refetching data once a user, re once a user is nearer to the bottom. And only virtualize at least item it seems so. On reach that. Which is another type of list. Right? Virtualize list. Let me see if this actually works. Suspected. Exactly. So once we are close to the bottom, in fact here is fetching is. Mm -hmm. So what it's doing is save area view, view, virtualize list, style sheet, text, and status bar. Uh, for example, it's going to render this on iOS here. Uh, launch snack. Installing app. Launching app. Okay. Because here, um, open. It is pretty fucked up. Does it work? Now? Okay. Uh, but it's quite okay because we have to re-render that component. In anyway, uh, let's go, let's go with the web, bro. Exactly. Let's go. Let's go for the web. So what it did here is just to say get items data and index item data to a string okay and then you do is this this is the item data the data that you're gonna show here and then you generate is a random string here another good way of generating a uh, random string is using the UUID or letting the backend actually handle that for you. Get items count. Uh, here we are just is generating is 50 elements. We can say, hey, I want you to generate is just 20. Exactly. Generate just 20. Uh, this is a type. And here's what you're going to do is this. So when this this is the render item. Hey, how this comp how this item will look like? The key extractor here. Uh, so you have to pass that unique ID to let the uh, React Native virtualize list. Hey, I want you to do this thing, blazing fast. I want to make this performance optimization. Uh, get item count. Interesting. Because you say, hey, uh, this is how you you have to tell to this. Uh, get item count 20, and then you say get item here. Which is what you're going to pass to the virtualized list. The get item here. Initial num to render. So here... So far, we're not seeing is uh, how you're going to re-render that. The thing here is that, for example, get item at item count is just to reach to 20. So, if you want to actually say, hey, um, uh, end scroll on end reach, 
like this on n rich you are going now to call that here so on n on n rich so on n rich this is part of the core component but this is on virtualized list you know virtualized list okay cool cool so far so good no problem with this uh, so well um, let me see if we can do a, a little a little exercise here you know, I want to do this little exercise here and that is here da, 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 da. okay Yeah, so one thing to note is that this scrolls, but the list header and list footer scroll with the content. Um, whereas if I added a bit of text outside the flat list, yeah, then this bit doesn't scroll. So this is something to bear in mind because uh, sometimes you might want to have the header like just one thing be sticky in this case you don't want to use the list header another property that you might you put a bit of text outside the flat list yeah then this bit outside the flat list Quick time player. What the f quick time player for real? Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. FaceTime, get out of here. Same for photo, get out of here. Same for map, no map, this of course, get out of here. Same for mail, get out of here. Same for music, get out of here. Get out of here. Okay. Okay, and again, this is for their demo, and the, and she got Shafari. Yeah, then this bit doesn't scroll. So this is something to bear in mind because uh, sometimes you might want to have the header, like just one thing, be sticky. In this case, you don't want to use the list header. Another property that you might, you'll probably not use every day. You'll definitely not use every time. But it's good to know is the extra data property. You can pass anything in there. It can be um, just a single item or, or an array. But basically, the flat list only gets re-rendered if the data changes. Mm-hmm. 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 But this is from the flat list. Or well, the virtualized list. Uh, extra data. Mm-hmm. Do, do, do. The flat list only gets re-rendered if the data change. Pretty much like a use effect. You can think of this some sort of use effect. And you can act upon that. It's not the same, it's similar in, uh, in concept. Mm -mm -mm. So if the renderer, um, just a single item or an array, 
but basically the flat list only gets re-rendered if the data changes. So if the render item function that you have renders different things based on something in your environment that's not the data, you'll have to put these things in the extra data. Use every day, you'll definitely not use every time. What is good to know is the extra data property. You can pass anything in there, it can be um, just a single item or an, or an array. But basically, the flat list only gets re-rendered if the data changes. So if the render item function that you have renders different things based on something in your environment that's not the data, you'll have to put these things in the extra data. If your render item, exactly, if your render item... The list only gets re-rendered mm -hmm. if the data changes. So if the render item function that you have if the render item function that you have renders different things renders based different on something, things in, based your on something in your environment not the data, you'll have to put these Okay. So for example here mm -hmm. Question. Is this from extra data or is this from flat list? Does flat list contains this? Flat list contains this? Extra data? Interesting. Okay, extra data and section. Because this is from section and flat. Okay. Section and flat. So the flat list only gets re-rendered if the data change. So for example, data changes. So if the render item function that you have exactly. If the render function item that you have render something outside of your environment renders different things based on something in your environment okay or render different things but this is something very okay okay so if you render functions items that you have render something different based on your environment whether it is on dev exactly whether it is on dev prod dev dev staging stage staging prod different tiers different product tiers Okay. Oh my God. Then is okay. Then this render. That's not the data. You'll have to put these things in the extra data. Mm hmm. You will exactly. You will have to put this in the extra data. But this is something very, very important. Why is this? Because this is something that when you, for example, I come, Scott Moss, when they describe uh, about the API design in Node, and he mentioned that now the vast majority of applications, it is important to develop your app environment driven, it means that it gives you much more flexibility when it comes to do certain thing or to let the application behave in certain scenarios, certain stage, uh, not only for development, but also uh, in for different products, the market marketing teams. Uh, that's when you say, oh, okay. That makes a lot of things here. So when you want to render different things on the rent so on the render item you want to render different things 
uh, based on your environment, uh, this is what you put, uh, so you have to put uh, things in there. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you have a ticket or you have a feature, they say, hey, you know what? I would like you to, um, ba -ba 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 -ba, yeah. um, mm -hmm. I would like you to render a specific or, or show specific elements based on some use case or based on some scenarios, okay? Uh, for example, if you have a driver app, so based on those scenarios, you want it to actually show a certain data. And that makes a lot of sense with extra data. Again, this is what you want to tell to your list uh, to re-render uh, when the data change. Mm -hmm. So, but, mm -hmm. Okay, so the idea here is that it's not necessary to memorize that, but to understand what can you do with this, especially if you need to provide a solution to someone else. So that's, that's something that might save you some hours of debugging. I wish someone had told me before I spent hours on this. It may happen, it may happen that you, it may happen, it may happen though that you, though that you, that what you display depends on some external factors. In this case, they use extra data to passing any variable that should also trigger a re-render when changed. Um, another thing, I think someone asked this on the chat, which is can you render things um, horizontally and Flatlist actually has a prop called horizontal uh, which takes true or false and this renders, renders the list horizontally rather than vertically. Another thing that's cool is that it has a num columns um, property which mm -hmm. horizontal okay, ho horizontal Okay, and here I want this to you got it. No component less there you got. No less. And this. Caddy Graman note. And then you got a horizontal here. Uh, horizontal renders the list horizontal instead of vertically. That's quite interesting. Horizontal. Horizontal. Okay. Okay, horizontal here. Okay. Just do. And finally, on end reach, this um, you can pass a callback here, um, which will get fired when the user has scrolled to the end of the list. And this is handy for if you're doing data fetching. Uh, if you have pagination, so you'll know when to paginate. There's also attributes that let you customize when this gets triggered, like how far here, um, which will get fired when the user has scrolled. 
no columns, true, two. Yeah, it just renders these in a column, which is so handy um, because on the web this is a huge hassle. And you can pretty much make this any uh, amount of numbers. And finally, on end reach, this um, you can pass a callback here, um, which will get fired when the user has scrolled to the end of the list. And this is handy for if you're doing data fetching, uh, if you have pagination, so you'll know when to paginate. There's also attributes that let you customize when this gets triggered, like how far in advance do you need to know. Now that you know everything there is about Flatlist, um, let's put this into practice. Um, these colors you might have already recognized are from the Solarize color scheme, which is one of my favorites. And the color palette actually consists of 16 colors, not just four. And here's all of them. I would like uh, you to modify your code to use a flat list to display all these colors. Here's um, a screenshot of what I would expect you to look on. And for extra credit, you could also try figuring out how to display the text in dark for the lighter palette colors. Mm, what would you expect on the silicon? Okay, I love it. Yes. Okay, so that'll be all for this video. Take care. Bye bye.